So, hello. Good evening. Welcome to the Center for the Less Good Idea. We are, for many of us in the room, um, at the end of a five-day process, an enormously interesting process, which has been called Art, Archives, and Performances, in which artists, researchers, and thinkers from all over the world, from Brussels and France, Colombia, Benin, and South Africa have come together and worked through the body, through performance, um, and, and through each other in thinking about how we can enter um, and activate archives and often those controversial images. Um, this has been a long time collaboration with the Center for the Less Good Idea. Um, and um, between the Center for the Less Good Idea and some of the universities based in Paris, Paris 8, Nanterre, and the university based in Benin. Uh, and one of the collaborations has been a seminar cycle that we've been curating over the last many months. And in that seminar cycle, we invited Sabine, who will be with us on Zoom from Portugal tonight, to share with us this work that she's been developing. Now, Sabine Tunison is a sonographer. She is an artist who designs exhibition spaces, theater spaces, opera spaces, and alongside many extraordinary artists has been a collaborator of William Kentridge's since 2002. Uh, but this is her own work, and she has brought together some extraordinary collaborations. She works through her hands. We were able to invite Sabine earlier well, actually late last year, to run a mentorship here at the center, which she titled Thinking Through Cardboard, in which she took both international and local artists through her process of coming to solutions through her hands, through the making, and through cardboard. And so it's through this long collaboration that we get to this point, this point in the So Academy, in which... Uh, we have recently, more recently launched the Academy for the Less Good Idea. What is it to be uh, together in a kind of thinking space outside of the institution, but still learning? And the title of this particular series that Sabine will share with us, in which Sabine will share with us tonight, is How Showing the Making. And so this is what Sabine is, is doing. After the interval today, we will see her film, White Box Jacket. And that film will be interacted with in a live way with some of her collaborators, the South African dancer and performer, Tulani Chaoke, and the Beninian Brussels-based percussionist musician, Angelo Mustafa. So that's gonna be very exciting. But before we get to that point, Sabine has done the most extraordinary thing. She has worked backwards through her process for us. It's called the reversible journey, where she takes us through the steps of her thinking, where she's reached out to people, some of whom are in the room, like Gregory Manoma, the incredible choreographer, and other collaborators from all over the world, and even during the pandemic, to find the solutions and the thinking through discussion, through making, and through each other. And so, Tonight, I welcome Sabine Tunison into the room. Here she is. Hello. We can give her a round of applause. It's such an honor to have you here with us tonight, Sabine. It's pretty Thank bizarre. You, <laughs> Good. <laughs> Lovely to see you. And so what Sabine Lovely will be doing? to see you too. <laughs> it's like winter and summer coming together. It's great. Yeah, exactly. How's Portugal? Hot? Very warm. Very warm. Very well, warm. we're... Very hot. Very we're, hot. We're yeah. we're I have a fan. Oh, good. <laughs> we're having our, um, our usual... Johannesburg winter, which ends at 11 a.m. each day. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, so, uh, so just to explain to everybody, Sabine will be taking you live through her journey whilst the film she has prepared plays. 
And that is, takes us till the interval in which we invite you to go and get another drink, stretch your legs, and then join us for what will be an extraordinary experimental performance with the film by Tulani Chauke and Angelo Mustafa. So thank you for being here tonight. Okay, uh, good evening. Uh, so I think Brownwin told you all about uh, what you will, you're gonna see tonight. I just wanted to thank her very, very warmly. Uh, she led us to this journey in a very beautiful way. Uh, I also want to thank Anna Sederer, who is based in, in Belgium, and uh, who put us together. It was like a nice uh, jigsaw puzzle and, and uh, superposition of, of people and energy. Uh, and the Center for the Less Good Idea is the golden team to prepare this kind of experience. And of course, I want to thank William Kendridge, without whom uh, nothing of this would happen tonight. Um, so let's start. And uh, just uh, wanted to tell you that this film that you're going to see is telling the journey of a project of mine called White Box. started in Stockholm in September 2017, while I was visiting an installation at the Moderna Music. It was a video installation of the Irish artist Gerard Byrne. My first visit to the Biologiska Music was just a sort of a touristy visit. And I was really fascinated by the fact that the space that the Arama is only lit by natural light. I started to make a connection to photography through thinking of the museum as a kind of a camera. The museum has that form, and, and then light enters the space through an aperture in the roof and illuminates the image inside. And then there's also like an audio, sort of environmental audio track that accompanies the film. So I think it's a very, very unique place. I hope it doesn't close. Well, unfortunately, the Biological Museum is now closed, but I had the chance to visit it before, and I was like him really fascinated by this gorgeous place who tells us about illusion, about artificial nature, and about staging the nature in a photographic way, but also in a theatrical way, using the daylight and the 360 degree view. Next to this installation, there was a small room dedicated to early photography. It was a sort of a footnote for the work of Gerard Birne. And this is where I saw first this picture, a small black and white photography showing a gas balloon lying on the, on the ice. The legend of this picture mentioned Polarex Expedition 1897. This image struck me immediately. I had no idea about the story that was hidden behind. I never heard about this Polarex expedition before, but I could feel the strong impact and its huge narrative charge, so enigmatic, so mysterious and beautiful, 
I didn't, it didn't leave me and I had to dig deeper to understand why I was so fascinated. I've always been interested in photography. And at that moment, I remember that I saw a very beautiful exhibition in London a few years before at the Tate Britain, which was about one of the most important figures in the history of photography and in theory or philosophy of photography, Edward Maybridge. For Edward Maybridge, Photography was a true revolution, a way to be able to see around and behind us. He developed specific devices and lenses to scan the landscape as a full circular diorama. The limit of the image was no longer a frame, but it became like an infinite landscape. He also invented a unique system to capture and decompose the movement in a series of still frames, setting a battery of cameras and ultra-fast shutters, automatic shutters along a track that the horse would trigger while he was galloping. This is what he called locomotion, meaning that after defying the limit of space in photography, with this system, he was now defying time. For his locomotion experiments, he used the physical grid drawing lines on the floor and on the wall, and he used it as an objective reference for motion. He was then able to consider the movement out of its constituent parts. This study leads me to the new idea that the movement is fixed and the time is actually mobile. One year later, I'm still haunted by this picture. Trying to understand the reason of this fascination, I discover another other picture of the same photograph. His name is Neil Strindberg. I imagine a first intention nota. I didn't know exactly what to do with this, but I knew I had to do not something. I had in mind this idea of movement and photography and somehow wanted to gather them in a scenic project. The nota describes the Polarex expedition, the project of a man, André, 42 years old, engineer, extremely passionate, curious, dedicated and very daring. He had this crazy idea to fly over the North Pole in a gas balloon in order to complete the map of the world with the Arctic polar regions. He invited then Neil Strindberg, a young and brilliant photographer of 24 years old, to take part to the expedition. Nils is probably the character who interests us the most. Like my bridge, he was adept at panoramic photography. He is not only a photographer, but he is also a physicist, astronomist, violinist, and was about to get married. The third person on board was Knut Frankel, 28 years old, recently graduated from the Technical Institute of Stockholm. He was chosen to be the meteorologist, but also he was chosen for his strong physical condition. They left from Svalbard on July 1897, uh, and they never came back. The 92 pictures that Nils took during their journey have been found by pure coincidence in 1930, meaning 33 years later under the eye by a crew of whalers who stopped on White Island to catch walrus and seals.
with the project got the first name, White Island. White Island as a reference to the place where they spend their last moment, but of course also as a tribute to their memory and to the memory in general, to photography and to the infinite landscape where they were locked in. This intention nota was rather a question, how to put in theater, on stage, all the impression given by the picture without killing their mystery, their poesy. I realized then that I was more interested into the photos than into the story. The camera as a black box containing the memory as a metaphor to their death. They knew that they would die. This picture, a real legacy to the fortune. At that moment, many thoughts enter into collision. Something pushed me to resist to tell the story with words. I was rather interested in a tale using its essence, its material. It became clear that dance was the way to bring all the pieces together as supposed as words. Yes, that's it, dance and music on stage to create a place for the magic of theater, a possibility for transmo transformation and illusion. Just before, I had met a wonderful choreographer, Gregory Makoma, from South Africa, Johannesburg. For sure, the project desire came from the fascination of the pictures, but same importantly, it came from people encounters and the gathering. First, my long-term friend, Adelaide de Cates. We did study architecture together in Brussels. And from day one, she became my accomplice, my advisor, and she accompanies in all researches and helps with documentation. She is my echo chamber, often critical, sometimes skeptical, but always benevolent. Actually, we're quite complementary. Then, Phyllis Ross. I remember this afternoon when we had a coffee together in Brussels. She was in Brussels for an opera production in La Monnaie, where we had met many years before. Phyllis is a very talented light designer coming from Tel Aviv. When I told her that I wanted to put this picture on stage, but I had no idea how to do it. She was very enthusiastic and she said, I love it, I'm with you. For costumes, I couldn't imagine to work with someone else than Greta Goiris, my Belgian Zusche, meaning little sister, with whom I'm working on all William Kendridge's projects since ever. I feel that we share the same sensibility of materials, colors, and expressivity on stage. And I think that with time, we develop the common eye and fantasy. Jonas Lindquist is actually the one who brought me first to the Moderna Museet to see this exhibition. He probably had no idea about the obsession that would follow then. Once he even said to me, Sabine, stop please, it's only water and ice. Jonas is a Swedish mechanical designer, head of the opera workshop in Stockholm and parts of William's team as well. 
we have met first, working on the installation of refusal of time for Documenta in Kassel, where I fell in love with this moving machine. This was the first shape of my working family, where well, there was no music composer or video designer yet. I had to find them, and that was the beginning of a long journey. Eight months later, I bought the diary of the expedition in its French translation, translation from 1931 and read it carefully. What moved me the most are the notebooks founded at the same time than the picture, because we discover, in parallel to the picture, their story and their intimacy. They offer a new material that fits the narrative charge of the pictures and make them alive. We can also read the eraser. The last pages of the notebook are almost unreadable. They are heart-touching. The book offers a wealth of information about the departure, the preparation, and discovery of the remains 33 years later. I propose here to hoover the content. The book starts with the portrait of the three men. I won't come back to the description, but it's quite astonishing to see, to, to see how this extremely difficult condition of the expedition revealed the different personalities. André, as an engineer, is attracted by things. He was obsessed by observing and studying the ground, the ice, the underwater. He even built a little sieve to catch floating particles in water. He spent his day catching and collecting little pieces of moss, plants, stone, feathers, seagull eyes, seaweed, fish tail, walrus tooth, etc. Methodically and systematically, he wrapped them specimen carefully, watertight, he sought and labeled them in all in more than 120 little beautiful packages that has been found intact later. It was a real message for legacy. Neil Strindberg, as a scientist, remember he was a physicist and an astronomer, found himself the best into the sky. Day after day, he was surveying above his head the clouds, the wind, the stars, the sun, mapping them probably in a music score in mind. He was inhabited by music, but also by memories of his fiancée. We know that he was writing her letters since they were found together with the notebook. His photographies allowed him also to escape the daily distress. When we observed the 92 pictures saved, we realized that it when he went beyond the role of uh, expedition photographer, the staging of the picture shows a sense of abstraction, but also a kind of fantasy, which helped him for sure to take distance from reality. Then Knut Frankel, as a meteorologist, was him in charge of the weather reports. He was chosen for his strong physical condition, but the diary shows us that actually is the one who suffered the most from the cold, from the bad food, from exhaustion. We often read passages where his fellows took care of him, giving him food massages, carrying him to keep going, while he was meant to take the heavy part of the journey. It's very touching to see the warm solidarity, the camaraderie, and the complicity in the team. As a conclusion, while André and Nils have been able to escape the real and the present thanks to their abstract mindset, Frankel stayed in the here and now and suffered the most from it. I like to believe that the, the mental and imagination are probably a stronger medicine than physical strength. Now let's go to the following chapter that describes the preparation. Remember, the purpose of the, the expedition was to take picture and measurement for mapping the North Pole still unknown. For that, Neil Strindberg imagined a very innovative camera with interchangeable objectives, unique or stereoscopic. This enables him to scan the landscape first from the sky, then from the eyes to compose panoramas. 
Among the preparation, note that Andre spent several years to study a hydrogen balloon called the Eagle, for which, after many tests, he would call Henri Lachambre, a French balloon constructor. Its envelope is made out of 600 square patches of, of silk sewn together and wax to ensure their sealing. The following picture illustrates the discovery of the remains in 1930-33 years later after their di disappearance. For the very first time, the buried remains are brought back to the surface of the memory in a deep emotion of the lost and found. The digging work, looking like an archaeology ceremony, comes to an end, and the slow way back starts in a long and solemn naval procession that slides towards Stockholm, where the memory and the glory of the three heroes is celebrated in the presence of the king with the day of national mourning. Thanks to Strindberg's notes and record, we could retrace their journey. First, three days in the air, in the gas balloon, from 11 to 14 of July, when the balloon collapsed on ice. Then, a long and difficult walk, pulling their boat and sledges in two steps the first until the 4th of August, walking against stream, then from August 4th till September 17, the walk towards the Seven Islands, struggling against wind. Finally, exhausted, they give up, and they let themselves drift. They build an igloo on a piece of ice. The flag will crash on the White Island the 5th of October. The pictures of the balloon lying on the ice are iconic. They came to us miraculously, thanks to the precious skill of a photographer, John Hertzberg, who managed to bring life back to the scenes that kept secret during 33 years, and this from traces of images almost erased of 243 negatives. From then, from then he was able to save 92. He immediately made copies of those, but he just died after and had no time to achieve all recalls and labeling. Therefore, the original negative have been misplaced and the copies have been confused with the original. Thanks to Herbert, we discovered their camp, the equipment, the guns, the three folks on the stage for the picture. We see them exhausted, pushing their boat, hunting polar bears and struggling against wind. With the lifting of the stones of Strindberg's grave, the question of destiny is raised again and becomes obvious. The memory of the story comes back by layers, which, like an envelope, is protecting the secrets and delivers them entire, entire to us.
impressed and touched by the reading of the diary, I thought it's precise transcription. I stick to the facts and keep the picture away for a moment. I thought all information per kinds, color, sounds, animal, feelings, food, weather, facts, light, disease, and put them all on separate sheets of paper, hoping to find inspiration for play. The same summer, my father is ill. Luckily, I can accompany him during his last period. He's aware of his coming death, and he starts to tell me his life methodically, chapter by chapter, going back in time as if the clock was turning backwards. Last time he talked to me, he was six years old, and he was learning to ride a bicycle. This is for me like a revelation. It confirms an intuition I got before. Here comes a decision. I was going to rewind the story to tell it backwards and therefore get rid of its concrete and pragmatic side. The polar expedition transcends the news item. It's a tale dedicated to the memory, to legacy, to the fortune and death. Reversibility turns situation in the meaning. For example, dying becomes coming alive, leaving becomes arriving, but it also reverses the physics and the dynamics of the actions and movement. Let's imagine a pendulum swinging backwards. The impact of the beginning, the back and forth that gets narrower and faster becomes an awkward movement that starts with a shy shaking, then grows up but stops suddenly, as if it had been swallowed by a magnet. We defy the rule of gravity. At last, reversibility teases the logic of reality and makes it all magic. An igloo that crashes takes its perfect shape back miraculously. A water splash becomes a perfect drop. And this process offers a huge flexibility to the narrative and open window for very refreshing creativity for dance, for music, playfulness, and onirism. From now, the project is a distortion of the true story. It transforms its destiny, the failure is turned into a victory, and the drama could, could become a comedy. The name of the project changes from White Island to White Box, the contraction between White Island and Black Box. Black Box as a reference to the camera and photography, of course, but also as a reference to the sealed box keeping entire all the secrets and memories that will be revealed, a metaphor of memory and legacy. During the same summer, Adelaide and myself were, uh, go to Sweden for a week of study. We start with an excursion to Grena Museum, the small family town of André, where is located the museum dedicated to the expedition Polaris. It's a real temple where I kept the remains found on the White Island. Plus, they have all the full archive with thousands of photographies, the one taken during the expedition, but also the one taken after and before, during the preparation, showing the instruments, the camera, the balloon, the balloon shed, whose plan I really like. Thanks to the head of the museum, Akrad, we will get access to the high resolution scans of the original negative. During the same trip, we go to the Techniska Museum in Stockholm to look at other archives documents. We have the chance to see the copies of the negative that John Elsberg made in 1930. A very touching moment, I must say, vital in the process that confirms the idea of reversibility of time, in which I see an astonishing echo of the negative in the picture. We go then to the National Library, hoping to find the original notebook of the expedition, but unfortunately, they're not accessible. As a compensation, we stop then at the newspaper archive floor, where we look, where we look at articles from 1930. They show how sensational the discovery was at the time. A bit disturbed now about the urge of the tabloids compared to the intimacy of the story kept safe and secret until then. We push then the curiosity until August Strindberg's house, who was the uncle but also the godfather of Nils. 
And then we discover other characters and books. Swedenborg, who was the reservist, reservist and later on did badly criticize André's expedition. The original edition of the diary in Swedish with more pictures, the report of Henri Lachambre, the Parisian balloon maker, and his nephew, photographer Alexis Machuron, who became friends with Mills. But above all, we, dis we discover two figures, Gurli Linder, the lover of Salomon Auguste André, an avant-garde poetess, feminist, and social activist, and finally, we discover Anna Charlier, the fiancée of Neil Strindberg. She is a key in the construction of the project. Anna was a pianist and got engaged with Nils just before his de departure. A portrait has been found back almost erased on the White Island in the inner pocket of Neil's jacket. We also found in Neil's package the letters that he wrote to her. The last one is dated July 31st. Then we all meet in Brussels for the first workshop in Squatelier. It's the name of my studio where I prepare my project. I used to start working by building a model. It is for me an unavoidable step, like a warm-up. It's my way to think. The model has this special power to gather people and immerse them immediately in the project in a very intuitive way. At this stage, the model looks like a big leporello that can take different shapes. The audience is installed on a large tribune, completing the octagonal shape of the panoramical set. I still have in mind the biological museum, also octagonal, that works like a panoptical place where the site is central and looks all around. And, of course, also still in mind the research about panoramical vision of Edward Maybridge. The model is articulated in order to fold and unfold to evolve during the play. It would slither as if it was on the ice floor. At first, it would be a projection screen, like a long background, making a landscape, an infini, like we say in theater. Then it would shift towards an architecture that recalls the octagonal construction of the balloon house. I replicate the clever wooden structure of the balloon house made out of scaffolding with triangular landings. It reminds me the white cotton border of the biological museum that masks the top limit of the painted diorama. I look at the picture of the balloon house carefully. They have been taken by Nils and Alexis Machuron before the departure. They are all gathered in the great essay of Tyrone Martinson, which soon become my, my bedside book. Tiron is a Swedish researcher and photographer. After Nils and Herzberg, he is for me the third and last messenger to report the history of the expedition's picture. So many images in which I cannot resist to see all the elements of a theater set. The squeaking of the machinery in motion, the strength of the wind in the fabric, the noise of the inflating balloon in the shade. My model research went to several steps. They, are, they all circulate around the idea of the panorama in various declination. I'm fascinated by this long assembly of seven stills of Nils that I discover digging deeper in Tyrone Martinson's work. 
While he was researching for his PhD thesis, Tyrone discovered by coincidence the original negative of the expedition that, has, that had been lost after Herzberg's death. He then understands the misunderstanding. The ones that we knew so far are actually copies made in 1930, but the original were forgotten in an attic of the Royal Academy of Science in Stockholm during 66 years, exposed to the temperature and hygrometric differences. They're almost unreadable, but on the other side, they are also of a better quality than the copies that were slightly blur. Comparing both, Tyrone managed to deduce new clues about the expedition, but mostly at the bottom of the original negative, there is a black strip that was not existing on the copies. It shows mysterious signs that Tyrone manages to decode. They tell us the date, the time, the geolocation, the direction. This is how it was possible for the first time to put back these seven pictures in the original order and find out that they were actually forming a sequence, a panorama. In my third variation, still hexagonal, that you see there, I chose another picture of Nils that he took before his departure. It's a panoramical view in three parts of the landscape of Svalbard, the place from where the balloon took off in 1897. Tyrone went back on Nils' footsteps and took the same picture 99 years later in colors. We observe that the time is not only erasing the, 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 the images, but the eyes itself meant to disappear. The next month, in November, Adelaide and I finally meet Tyrone Martinson at the University of Göteborg, where he teaches. He's interested by our research, flattered by the interest to his work, and he shows us the preparation of his second book about Nils, focusing this time more about cartography. Shortly after, in Vienna, I meet Jörg Wiedmann, a famous and brilliant composer that I discovered recently. His music blew me away. I'm told that he's unapproachable, but I'm very persistent and I finally get an appointment with him where I propose him to collaborate. He's intrigued by the project, he's very tempted to say yes, but he asks for a reflection period. He ends up sending me a very touching letter where he explained why he finally decided to decline my invitation.
since we cannot meet and since This is Catherine Van Dorf, the composer. Since we cannot meet, and since I'm not patient. Since we cannot meet, and since I'm not patient, uh, I take a decision. In order to keep the energy of the team alive, I will bounce on the fragmentation that the pandemic inflicted. And I choose for everyone in the team an individual picture. I ask to send them to send me a reaction without giving them an instruction about the format all accepted to play the game. Here is the picture that I chose for Gregory. Then the one I dedicated to Catherine that I can see diving in this polar abyssal water. André posing in front of his prey is for Greta with the secret wish that she would bounce on the polar bear skin that I find quite inspiring. The beautiful picture taken from the balloon for Felice, the still of the three forks penultimate picture of the series for Jonas. I chose the one with the team checking the ceiling of the balloon for Adelaide and at last the view of the lying balloon on ice for Tyrone and as a bonus the picture of Anna that I offer to myself. And here the material that I got in return. The fragments that I have to put together, like pieces of a puzzle. Catherine did respond the first with this soundtrack that the photo inspired to her. Gregory and Tulani are dancing the river. I'm surprised about their choice of dancing a duo, while the story depicts three characters. I got a miniature costume from Greta, Again, a single costume, the exact replica of the forks from Jonas, and two texts, beautiful, one from Adelaide and one from Tirpo. I start with the cutting paper 
and I shaved Tulani and Gregory without really knowing where that would lead me. I follow my hands and I get hundreds of cut out figures. My intuition pushes me to fragment the movement, to decompose, to decompose it in order to recompose it in a different tonality. After that, I begin the collage of the fragments in a, in a first storyboard, very small first. I give them an order and already imagine possible transitions. The storyboard grows and develops And finally, goes to the wall. I depart from Anna's picture reconstitution and I decide to weave back the story from her point of view, as if she was going back in her memories. I want to keep close to the picture and to the paper. In December 2020, all the schools are shut and theaters and institutions. The Squatelier, however, is like a factory for many hands. We meet every day to cut, to build and film. I start to edit, we keep cutting, building and filming.
In total, my Indian PR and myself will have cut about 4,800 figures, a practice close to therapy, a bit addictive, almost obsessional, but it is mostly a fantastic way to observe and zoom in over the dancers in, in motion. After that, we replace them in the three-dimensional space of the model, taking the objective lens of the camera as our reference.
actually really it's better to you be are over it because you need to yeah, be there somewhere. And, and you have to be around yeah you. and if you oh. Oh, if you <laughs> start so i can have a little momentum that's but great aren't we afraid we're gonna push this yeah, we are afraid but we are brave also we have to go around so okay. Perfect. Do, I, do i do it maybe i can do it myself and then you give it to me and i will yes Très doucement. Mm -hmm. Tourne la grande table. Tu peux prendre ça. Et moi je prends la table. de plus bouger ton, ta main droite vers moi, vers moi la main droite, vers elle. Ça prend celle-là. pas la table, je retourne vers toi. In June, I got a message from my producer, Lori, who tells that the Orion Theatre in Stockholm is interested by the project in its scenic form. They propose a date for the premiere in October 2022. This is very unexpected, almost too beautiful to be true. The Orion Theatre is an industrial shed from late 19th century, gorgeous place. It looks like the perfect place for this expedition. I got to visit it and I'm charmed, both by the space and by the team. 
I immediately build a model in order to think to the staging based this time on the film. In November, the film is edited. Its definitive name is White Box Jacket. A first public screening takes place in Orion Theatre. It's followed by a public conversation called A Photographic Journey into Memory. The meeting is folded by Adelaide. We invite Liza Malong, neuroscientist, researcher in the field of memory. She develops the question of its mechanism when approaching death. We also invite Tyrone Martinson, who joined us remotely from Göteborg, Jonas Lindquist, and of course, Tulani Chauke, South African dancer, who offers us the solo, Death to Life, in direct. struggling to keep the high, the pressure, deep pressure, falling, uh, aspiration, and then crash slowly with the heart.
with you, see what I mean? And pick up. <laughs> okay. okay, this is it. <laughs> I think we take a, a break. Yes. And uh, we find later, we find each other later. Like 10, 10 minutes or 15 minutes? 15 minutes. 15 minutes break, interval, and we'll see you back here for the live performance. Yeah. Thank you, Sabine. Right. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Sabine, Angelo, Tulani, and, um, and your full team. It's, uh, it's, I think, an incredibly generous thing for an artist to think about the process and, and the meticulous steps, the rigor with which they are going through the, the journey of, of making the frustrations, the questions, the, ins the insecurities, and, and, um, and then to compile it in the way that you have. And Sabine, you did this uh, for us in a, in a slightly different version and in French before for the PhD yeah. students in Benin and in Paris earlier this year. Uh, and to now do it in English, uh, it really is, I think, an extraordinary thing you you bring a kind of a teaching to, yeah. to all of us as makers, which is so important. And I think what, what is magnificent about it is that rather than making it less magical or mysterious, which is what art often tries to do, sort of veil the process, uh, it, it to me makes it only more, more magical uh, yeah. to, to know all of those interactions, the inventing, uh, and, and the curiosities that came to you. Um, so, uh, yeah, I, I want to also just say that Angelo and Tulani, we've had five days of collaborating with you, and it's thanks to you, Sabine, that we were able to meet Angelo and that he was able to join us <laughs> through Brass. And we, we are all um, trying to work out how to get him a South African passport. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> how do we keep him here? <laughs> many <laughs> Angelos, many Angelos. Um, but it's, it's also just extraordinary to see how your, your rigor and your research and, and these images from an archive are then translated and extended and shaped and layered by the languages that, that Angelo and Tulani and your other collaborators bring in their response to the image. And so um, that is uh, something we've enjoyed thoroughly in our collaborations this week as we had the benefits of working closely with, with Tulani and with Angelo and with others in the room who've joined us both from abroad and locally. But um, I'm going to open the floor because we have an audience here who, so uh, um, Sabine can see us in that camera. And um, if there are any questions, I know there's a little roaming mic, I hope. There, yes, there is one at the back. If there are any specific questions for Sabine, for Angelo, for Tulani, for the team, um, please go ahead. This is your opportunity to ask. Um, and uh, where needed, we'll do some translations. Well, I won't, but somebody will, hopefully. <laughs> uh, Sabine is also there for that. Um, so yeah, please do <laughs> feel, <laughs> feel, feel free to... I'm well tonight with English. <laughs> <laughs> feel, feel free to to ask a question, make a comment. Um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I, I just, before, before there is a question, uh, you must understand the first time we did this live uh, version of White Box Jacket was uh, two weeks ago here in Portugal, where I, when, where I am now. And uh, we did it with the composer and the violinist, Catherine Grandel, who mm -hmm. couldn't travel to South Africa. So Angelo and Tulani had to cope with the lack of violin. Mm -hmm. And I must say chapeau in French. Well done, guys. Mm -hmm. uh, I was very curious and also a little bit nervous to sit without the violin because Violin is a kind of a key in this project mm -hmm. uh, since it's also the instrument of Neil Silver, so it's like the red thread. So well done, well done. It's beautiful. Mm. 
Yeah, I know there's there's also an online audience because we've been streaming. Um, if you if uh, anybody who is online spots a question, do let us know. But it looks like we have a question. Yes, uh, I I wanted to to congratulate you, Sabine. Uh, it's really beautiful to see it uh, and and to congratulate all of you. And I also wondered um, if I understand it well. I had the feeling that the performances you you did musically and 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 with the dance, it is really inspired on the first uh, idea you had to send them all some images, and on the answers they gave you um, when they reacted to the images through the dance movements, yeah. the songs. Yeah, it's a collage. It's all yeah. about uh, putting fragments together. Uh, and uh, of course, as an echo to the way that the story came to us, pieces by pieces, putting together. And uh, this live music form is like the second step of the journey. So the first step was the film, the second step is the film with uh, live music, live dance. And now we're working, developing the third step with uh, Gregory Matoma, Tulani, Fana, another dancer also from Johannesburg, Angelo, Catherine, and the performer, Andrea. So that will be for uh, in a year time. Uh, we do premiere in, uh, in Stockholm. Uh, and we hope to have co-producers uh, in Europe and maybe in the United States to make it happen because it's a bigger form with the stage, movement of stage, set, video. It's it's a bigger scale project. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, it's like a three steps project. Mm -hmm. And this is also very much because we had to do all these details because of the pandemic. And act actually, I think these details uh, might also feed the project at the end. Mm. Yeah. yeah, it's a real collaborative project where the languages of Ooh. each of yeah. the participants. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But that's the point of doing a project, no? Yeah. <laughs> to be together <laughs> with people. Yeah, I think, you know, often when we see a large scale theater production, for example, or, or a massive opera, the, you kind of, and, you, and you're seeing it fresh and you're seeing that, that for the first time, um, it's difficult to imagine those first steps. And, and there's something so human about your first steps. There's something that I think all of us can imagine ourselves doing. Um, and so it's also so, I think, inspirational for, for mm. young artists, for artists at any stage, for artists who are stuck, um, that, that it, it just takes a kind of a continued process but, and, and a being there on a day-to-day -day basis with that thing that stimulates you, but at the same time, it takes reaching out um, yeah. to those people this, who uh, interest you. This reversible journey film, the first film that you saw tonight, was for me a kind of uh, uh, reconnection or reconciliation with the project because uh, it, it, this project is so spread in time, so stretched. I've lost my uh, patience and uh, I was invited by a Stockholm University to do uh, a lecture with the students and uh, I couldn't travel there because of COVID. And uh, I was a bit tired of this PowerPoint, so I decided to do a, a film for them. And actually, I had no idea starting this film that it would be like a therapy to reconnect me with the project and, uh, and understand what was my uh, inner journey. Yeah. It was very nice to see, yeah. uh, to do, I mean. It was very nice to do. Uh, and uh, now I want to do another project. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Um, okay, so are there any other comments or questions? 
I think it's be it's been an extraordinary evening, Sabine, um, one that has captured and held us. Thank you. Uh, thank you to Lani and Angelo. And yeah, and thank you to all the team because it looks like easy, but my God, to put all these uh, screens and camera <laughs> and sound and the streaming all together is miraculous. Yeah. Absolutely. Wow. Thank you, Noah. Thank you, Athena. Thank you, Chris Waldo. Yeah. Thank you, Dima Katso. Thank yeah. you, Eli. Thank you, all of you. Yeah. Uh, very, very professional. Yeah. Yeah, I can't express and that. And thank you, tonight. Wesley. Wesley. <laughs> Wesley's up there on lights. Yeah. Um, no, absolutely. This, this space runs on, as you said, a golden team. Um, yeah. And there they are at the back. Uh, they keep this, this space going. They facilitate all of the art that happens here. They are key collaborators to it all. Um, and you know well how, how beautifully that works. And it's, it's, uh, this is typically the role that Athena Mazarakis has been playing uh, as the moment tour of the SO Academy. It is her, her, her brainchild to bring how showing the making to us as a program. And mm -hmm. um, I think this is the third how, uh, which will go onto our website, and we hope it becomes a kind of a library and a resource uh, that, that wow. students and artists can continue to access as they are moving through their processes um, in becoming who they want to be as makers in the world. But thank you, Sabine. Have a wonderful evening. Enjoy the warmth. Thank you very much. I will miss you all tonight. <laughs> <laughs> um, and thank you very much for this uh, kaleidoscopic evening. Beautiful. Great. Thank you. Thank you.